Welcome to the MYS Virtual Hangout. Here's your host, MYS Music Director, Raul Gomez. Good afternoon. It's an absolutely beautiful afternoon in Portland, Oregon. It's sunny and it's bright. And uh, I'm very excited to be back. We took a week off last week, no hangouts. And we're back and what a lineup of guests we have for this week. And of course, today we have Norman Wynn, the associate conductor of the Oregon Symphony. And a little bit later, towards the end of the show, I will let you know about the rest of our uh, guests this week. A truly amazing lineup. And we keep going right into next week. Um, I, so if you're new to the show, I just want to welcome you, first of all. And then um, this is a one hour long session that we have, and we do this live Tuesdays through Fridays. And we have amazing guests come in live via Skype, and we just chat. And of course, our main uh, audience, our primary audience, are uh, students and young musicians from the Metropolitan Youth Symphony here in Portland, Oregon, and their families and their friends and uh, you know the local artistic community and I'm very um, grateful for all the support that we have received uh, doing, uh, doing these hangouts. It's been super fun. Uh, we did five weeks in a row with amazing guests and, uh, and I've learned so much just talking to these amazing people. Um, if you're a Metropolitan Youth Symphony student, I want to remind you that registration is open for next season. So please go to our website, playmys.org, and you'll find a big button that says register. So please go ahead and register. And uh, auditions will be all via video uh, because we will not be able to uh, do auditions in person because of the current restrictions on uh, congregating. Uh, so social distancing compatible auditions for all MYS students uh, between June 1st and August 14th. Um, before we call Norman, uh, I have something to share with you guys. This is so exciting. So as you know, here in Portland, there are a bunch of uh, really incredible uh, performing arts organizations. And there are several new music ensembles or collectives, uh, contemporary music groups, basically. Uh, one of them is 45th Parallel. And uh, Ron Blessinger... Greg Ewer and uh, several other musicians from the Oregon Symphony uh, run this group. And Ron Blessinger posted something on social media earlier this week or uh, over the weekend that just kind of blew my mind. And you guys know how so many of us performers uh, have been doing uh, virtual uh, performances uh, using apps like a cappella, and that's just generally just one person doing uh, different. Uh, voices or uh, YouTube, ver uh, you know, remote performances where people record their part at home and then somebody puts all the videos together like the, like the ones we have been doing with the Metropolitan Youth Symphony. Well, and of course the big barrier that we've all been uh, dealing with is the impossibility of true live performance over something like Skype or Zoom because uh, of the problem of latency and delay. So, uh, and that's why we can't really play together at the same time and offer a true collaborative live performance. Um, well, 45th Parallel, they cracked it, they figured it out. And uh, they, oh, and actually I don't, I don't have the name of the uh, um, engineer, uh, be behind this, but Ron Blessinger and the uh, uh, folks from 45th Parallel partnered with this person and they created a brand new platform that allows them to actually play a truly live performance remotely. And I'm going to show this on the screen there. So this Friday at 6 p.m. Pacific, okay, they are going to debut this platform. Um, and they're going to play uh, in C by uh, Terry Riley. So you guys, you have to check this out. So this is just, of course, a screenshot from uh, Facebook, but uh, 
look them up if you if you maybe you're not in Portland, you know, like their Facebook page and then add this to your calendar. This Friday at 6 p.m. Pacific, of course, 9 p.m. Eastern, they're going to play a true live performance of in C. So I cannot wait to to see this. This is really terrific. It's groundbreaking and it's happening right here in Portland, Oregon. So add this to your calendars and check it out. It's very, very, very exciting. Uh, okay, so it's time to call Norman. So let me uh, get this uh, screen out of the way and we'll get Norman uh, on Skype. Let's cross our fingers so the uh, internet gods are in a good mood uh, right now. So here we go. It's great to see so many uh, friends watching on Facebook right now. And I think there's Norman. Hey, how's it going? It's, it's, I think so. Let me put you up on the screen. And there you are. It's great to see you, Norman. Awesome. Good to see you. How's it going? Oh, not much. Just hanging out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, I have something that I put up here, especially for you behind me. I don't know if you can see it from where you're sitting. And I thought we should just start with this, right? So for this is, I went to Louisiana State University for uh, my master's in DMA. And um, Norman, you went to Alabama for your undergrad. Yep. And of course, uh, many of you might be familiar with the... Uh, huge rivalry uh, between these two schools when it comes to football. So, and, uh, how, so how are you currently feeling about all things <laughs> college football, my friend? You mean about not winning a championship again? <laughs> I guess it's hard. <laughs> do, do you still think about it every night when you go to bed? <laughs> every single night. It's <laughs> no. <laughs> It's, it's crazy because I don't, I don't know if you if you kind of like get away from that world when you're out out of the environment. I mean, I remember living in Alabama. It was like Alabama football in the fall, like football game, game day. And I was in marching band too, so it like really took over my life. And like football game was on Saturday. Everyone talked about the game on Sunday. And then on Monday, everyone was like talking about the next game. Yeah. And then once the season was done, everyone was talking about spring training. So it was like, I mean, football is a huge thing. Good thing, though, like the losses don't hurt as much now that I've been away for a little bit. <laughs> like five minutes, I, I, I still have that sinking feeling. This year I did, too, because LSU. Actually, LSU was so good this year. So it Yeah, was so and I have to confess, you know, to, to be quite honest, uh, I... I'm a huge New Orleans Saints fan. Like that's my team. That's the team that when I when when there's a game on, I, I get more nervous than any performance. Like I'm, I I suffer through these oh, games. God. And you know the Saints have been pretty good in recent years. Uh, you know, um, but yeah. I still you know I just get really emotionally involved. But are are you from Alabama or? Yes. The, so. I'm uh, I was born and raised in Alabama, Montgomery, Alabama. Okay. And my, my mom still lives in a town called Prattville, um, Alabama. And so I, I um, my dad and sister, they're in Florida. So it's, it, uh, I still at least try to go back there once a, once a year. Yeah. And are you a Saints fan then or not so much? Not really. You know, I never really got into NFL. Okay. Yeah, okay. but people, I guess people were, if if there was a team that I grew up with, it was probably the Falcons. Oh, okay. So you're like look, looking north. Yeah, Atlanta was like our big city. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Um, I uh, arrived at LSU in uh, 2006. And uh, so uh, this was, and this was for my master's in violin performance. And I think it was 2007 that they won a, a championship. So I was there and I, my apartment was like right down the street from Tiger Stadium. And during my master's, I had season tickets. So I, I got to go to all of those games. But for me also, it was kind of a pain uh, because every time there's a, there's a home game, everything shuts down. 
right? And I would literally, like, if I have a gig anywhere on that Saturday, if I don't leave my apartment at, like, 10 a.m., I'm stuck. Like, literally, like, I can't go anywhere. Yeah, it's it's crazy. It's And same thing. I remember, I remember going to Tiger, Tiger Stadium at night, too. So if you're if you're listening, like going to Tiger Stadium, Death Valley, Death Valley, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Night, it's like the winning percentage gets a lot of higher because all the voodoo and you know Louisiana stuff. But uh, gosh, that was crazy. Just how like I think the crowd at uh, Tiger Stadium gets so loud that you can like there's a small record of like seismic activity. Yeah, it's yeah. Crazy. It's yeah. Awesome. yeah. And it was awesome. And uh, uh, but. 2006 was also the year after after Katrina that was in 05 and in 06 the New Orleans Saints uh that was Sean Payton's first year it was Drew Brees's first year and there was like the re whole rebirth thing that and the New Orleans Saints were very central to that because the city of New Orleans is you know uh they hold the Saints and you know uh, pretty close to their hearts so it was impossible not to just become involved with that storyline and then the saints you know when the went to the playoffs and then just three years after they won the super bowl so i went just all in new orleans saints and i didn't get that much into college football even though i was so close to them which i think is a good thing because my my fellow lsu fans they you know also they they suffer a lot and, and alabama of course has been a, a, a significant provider of that suffering so <laughs> Tell me about the marching band. So you, what, how, how was your involvement? So uh, I started marching band, and that was like the thing to do in high school, and especially the South because of football. Um, what's funny, a lot of people don't, don't know now about me is, um, well, actually, what I think one of the best years of high school for me were um, my marching band. We were a show-style marching band. So it was like... Um, the the show style like high stepping and if you if you've seen drumline um it's based on the hbcu um historically black college and universities uh marching style so we danced on the field and we high stepped and we played like you know top 40 songs on the field it was it was so 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 fun and eventually um i went to university of alabama where that was more of a traditional core style and we played you know things like Wizard of Oz and uh, stuff like that, or from The Wiz and a bunch of other stuff. And, and we got to travel all over the SEC to the different schools. And uh, yeah, it was so fun. Those were really brutally hot summers but for band camp, but it was yeah. definitely really fun. And um, let's go back even further. Uh, in time. Uh, so you, in your bio on your website, it says that you're the first person in your family to pursue a to pursue classical music as a career. Mm -hmm. So did anybody else in your family play music at any like skill level or was that around you growing up? Actually, it wasn't around me at all. My, my little sister, I have a little sister who's uh, eight years old. If she's watching, hi, Hannah. Uh, <laughs> cool. Eight or nine. I don't want to get that wrong. Eight. Eight. Uh, but she, she is starting on piano now, which is and has been playing for a couple of years. So it's cool. really cool to see someone in the family who's playing music. My other young sister, uh, Jennifer, who lives in Seattle as a pharmacist, played the flute. But I, um, my parents came there. My mom's an immigrant from Taiwan, and my dad's a refugee from Vietnam. And they both, I grew up in a restaurant. Um, cool. So I was... All, my childhood memories are like doing homework at the the restaurant ta the the furthest booth away and like busting tables when I was like eight for tits and sure the, sure um, just hanging around in in the back so yeah that was and actually my cousin brought home a trombone who's older than me um, when I was about fourth grade I think and I kind of was just fascinated with it. And waited until, you know, it's like one of those things where, like, um, we didn't really know what was available to, to us. And I just thought, okay, I have to wait until I get to seventh grade before I can play the trombone. 
And so I waited and eventually picked it up and was And never looked back. When did conducting come into the mix? Conducting, you know, in high school, I was always like fascinated with standing in front of the ensemble and like warming up uh, the band. I like always wanted to be the drum major, but I never could because I always played I played marching baritone, I played low brass instrument, and so that's like rare in, in a small school band, you know, and like, oh, Norman, you've got to, we need you in the low brass section. Sure. <laughs> and so eventually in college, my sophomore year, I started taking conducting lessons at Alabama and fell in love. I mean, really, it wasn't until college that I discovered orchestral music and classic the classical standard repertoire um and after that i mean i remember very vividly sitting in my uh room with some headphones on and on youtube and i was heard Mahler 2 the finale with rattle and cbso his last concert and for the first time and i was like oh my god this is this is what i want to do so yeah cool okay I was I did music education, so I was on track to be a band director. That was <sighs> my first yeah yeah passion. cool. And I, I want to ask you more about that specifically. But before we do that, let's uh, let's do our, our little game that we play on this show. Uh, your two truths and one lie for people watching to vote for which of uh, three statements is a lie. So let me put this up on the screen. Oh, actually, let me. Uh oh. Uh-uh. Looks like maybe we lost the connection for just a moment. Okay. Uh, let's see. Sometimes this just reconnects on its own, but if that doesn't happen, let's just let's just call back. Generally, it works out just fine when we call back. Gives me a moment to take a sip of coffee. Oh, he's calling me. Oh, I think we are connected. There you are. Sorry. No problem. Okay. Lost your game, game segment. Yeah, yeah. So, anyways, uh, I'm gonna put. I'm gonna ask you if if you would be willing to read each of these statements out loud, and I will reveal them on the screen. And folks watching, your job here is to vote for which of these statements you believe is a lie. So let's hear the first one. Okay. I have a small tattoo on my back right shoulder of the Deathly Hallows. Okay. So that's up on the screen. Let's hear statement B. Okay. I recently binge watched the entire Naruto series over 700 episodes in three months. Okay, that's up on the screen now, and let's hear statement C. I severely broke my left arm playing ping pong. Okay, so those are up on the screen, and you guys watching, you, you see them as A, B, and C. So uh, go ahead and vote uh, on the comments for which of these statements is a lie. And I also need to pick one, and I, I have not yet made up my mind. So <laughs> I want to see what people what people uh, vote for here. Uh, cool. So I'm going to leave those up on the screen uh, while we continue chatting. Um, you know, one thing that fascinates me, and I wasn't really aware of this until I came to the U.S., and more specifically since I came to Portland, actually, and it's this for high school high school musicians, the band track and the orchestra track and it seems to me that often uh you know you know many young musicians who are playing with their bands in high school like you maybe at the time are not aware of, of just orchestral music you know and because often they think of strings only when they think of of orchestra so was that the case growing up also yeah I, in in alabama i mean growing up Honestly, I think in Alabama, I'm sh I'm sure it's different now. But when I was in undergrad, undergrad, this was like 2006 to 2010. Um, there was like two or three string programs, period, in the entire state mm -hmm. in a school. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's pretty much band or choir. Sure, sure, sure. 
and you're you're right it's that if orchestra we just thought of like strings but that like wasn't even in my sphere to even i didn't know what a violin or any string instrument was when i um joined the band at mm -hmm. all and how how did you start gravitating towards orchestral music just just found it or somebody like started to feed you it or, or what? Yeah, my, my um a couple of folks my my teacher uh demandre thurman uh at the at the time at the university of alabama um was like okay norman we gotta like get you up to speed <laughs> and so he was like here's here's pines of rome listen to that and i was like oh my god this is amazing and he's like okay here's here's this and then it kind of like took on a life of its own. I was like, went to the music library. You know, you could like, at that time, we were like, check out as much CDs as possible, burn them onto your, uh, you know what I mean? Burn yeah, them yeah, yeah. your um, your iTunes, so you can have it on your iPod. And, um, and then my conducting lessons, we started, I think the, the first piece we started with was with um, conducting Wretched Ative in Messiah. It was like the first thing we like learn, and then we did Eine Kleine Nacht music, and then just like just to like go over super basic things, and that like got me into like before the Romantic era, and started my love for Mozart and Brahms, and, and um, yeah, that's that's kind of like how the interest started. And then you said, "I want to do a master's in conducting," basically, I imagine, and. Yeah, I, I, when I decided I wanted to be an orchestral conductor, I was like, okay, you know, we had this little, uh, a great cohort, it was of me and two other guys, we studied, um, some of my best friends, we studied with the same teacher, and we kind of like fed off of each other, it's like, um, eventually, you know, like, okay, workshops is like the thing to do, and like, get, get video, and then apply to, you know, you're the people who are, just a couple of steps ahead of you at those workshops and you get advice from them and like some of the grad schools with good teachers and then seeking out the teachers and so it was kind of like I think at that point I knew okay like masters is where I what I need to do next if I want to do this and uh, will you talk about uh, your master's program and where, where you went and what that led to it's so I eventually ended up at the Peabody Institute in Baltimore and studied with uh, Gustav Meyer, who passed away a couple of years ago. Um, and Marin Alsop was taught there as well a couple of times a semester. And Mark Han Thacker were my three primary teachers. And Ed Polachik um, was who I was a GA with. And eventually, like that was really special because we had an orchestra twice a week full orchestra twice a week, plus three sessions with a string quintet and piano leading up to those orchestra sessions. So it was like a lot of podium time. Yeah. And uh, and it was a, like a great relationship with the Baltimore Symphony too. And we got professional experience covering for them. And um, yeah, and that's sort of like what, it was a deep dive into it. When I was like, I basically went from like studying one piece of music for in like for like two or three months to like studying 15 pieces of music in a week and having to like you know, it's just like ah so but it was a lot of fun it was it was definitely an experience that I think laid down a really excellent built off the foundation that I got at Alabama did you stick around in Baltimore after your masters at all I didn't I was um, very fortunate enough to get a job with the Portland Portland Symphony in Portland, Maine, as uh, assistant conductor slash community and education liaison. So cool. it was nice to like go from from that to to a job. And you uh, you sent me a link to a video that we're going to share. Uh, so this is something you. The, this is something that you did while still in Baltimore, then I imagine during your master's. Okay, yes. so um, would, you, would you mind introducing it? Uh, yeah. And then after we play it, we'll, we'll talk about it more in detail. Sure, I can set it up. So um, basically, I, my friend and I, Stephen Mulligan, um, who's the associate conductor with the Atlanta Symphony, 
And we were there at the same time, and we started this group called the Occasional Symphony. And the mission of the Occasional Symphony um, was is to celebrate diverse holidays by performing in distinctive venues across Baltimore. Oh my God, I can't believe I still remember that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, and so essentially we like celebrated, like our first concert was celebrating Halloween and we, uh, we like created a brand new soundtrack to the cabinet of Dr. Caligari and basically watched like scenes and we played different pieces and like, okay, what, oh, this would, oh, Tchaikovsky would be perfect for this. They're like, this would be a great opening. And like, and we also commissioned three composers to write some music for different scenes. So like people, the audience was getting a nice mix of, um, of old and new and we did it and like the venue was very uh um important too because uh so we did a the concert in like a half burned church so like there was some wood exposed and brick and um we celebrated dr seuss's birthday at a children's museum a lot of different it's like those kinds of things and the the clip that we're gonna that you're gonna play soon I'm super proud of it because that was my first time. I do so. I do a lot of movies now with the Oregon Symphony and um, with different orchestras. And that movie is my uh, uh, like my biggest achievement. Achievement, I think, because like there was at the time it was just like, okay, we're gonna push mute on the screen. It's gonna shoot up on the uh, the projector, and we're gonna start like the accompaniment. No click track. Yeah. <laughs> You're going off of like old school, like what someone should be improvising with, but like watching. So like what we're about to watch is the the scene where the um, Dr. Caligari's the feature. And basically, I had to climb up the steps. Like it would be like goes like this with the knife and then stop and has this moment of reflection my dweller just like he goes and he touches and reaches and as soon as he touches her boom, the finale of Mahler 1 <laughs> what the start of the last movement of Mahler 1 and so it's just like what time it she goes what and like all the and then it goes into this chase scene but it's I, I like nailed it and I was so happy nice <laughs> so nervous but uh yeah, yeah, it was. It's it's a lot of fun, and and it's still the organization, the orchestra is still going on now. I mean, there's it's in its third music director, and the orchestra still. We wanted the orchestra to be paid, um, and they're still doing the Halloween concert, which still sells out every year. And nice. it's, it's an awesome, it's a fun thing. I'm super proud, and we can talk more about that later because I think starting something like that and the experience of putting all that together and keeping an organization going. Um, that really was very attractive to the people I was interviewing with. Um, it's still, it's still a question that gets brought up in interviews. If I'm have a job in tell us about occasional symphony, you know, like it. So, um, yeah, it, that was a great, great experience. Awesome. So, uh, I have the, uh, timestamp that you gave me. So we'll, we'll play from that to the end of the video. Um, we don't have to go to the end of the video, maybe a couple minutes like three, after. Three, four minutes. Okay, sounds yeah. good. Okay, so this is the Occasional Symphony, and uh, let me just make sure that all of my settings here are good, and uh, I am going to mute me, and I'm going to mute you, and then I'll play the video. Here we go.
Okay, uh, let me go back to the uh, screen here, uh, and let me make sure we can hear you. Okay, so can you hear me, Norman? I can hear you. Okay. Uh, uh, you so <laughs> nailed it, that moment. That's so cool. <laughs> So, and I have a bunch of questions. So, uh, so the only do you have a screen by your music stand, or is it just the big one? It's it's, it's just, just the big one. one. I was like, I was like looking, looking up there, there the whole time. time. Okay. <laughs> right, um, the person that's sitting over by you is that a singer? That's that's, that's Steven. Steven. So, so he, he conducted, conducted the, the first half of the. Uh, and, and he, he asked him that, walked, walked in, walked in, in yeah, and yeah, uh, yeah. sat down, down right, right there. there. <laughs> and uh, tell me about the hats. People are wearing hats. Oh, yeah. yeah so, so we asked, asked people to uh, dress, dress up for, for Halloween. Halloween. So, so there, there was a bunch of different people um, ah. dressed up in different costumes, costumes and, and, and things, things like that. that. Very um, cool. And at this point in the project, when this concert happened, I mean... Uh, were you guys able to pay musicians, or did that come later? Or how how did it work? So we we did a Kickstarter campaign to raise five thousand dollars, and um, yeah, it was that was like right when Kickstarter was just starting to have its um, to do its thing, and um, yeah, that's how we raised money for it, and and then you sold tickets and. Yep. Yep. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, right. right. We, we sold, sold tickets. tickets. So tickets, tickets were 20 bucks. We did use the Ben Bright, um, which also was kind of new at, the, the, at that, that time. And um, yeah, yeah, we, we didn't, didn't really solicit for any, for any donations, donations or, or anything. anything. It, it was, was or, or actually, actually other than, than Kickstarter. Kickstarter. Yeah, yeah, sure. Kickstarter and ticket sales. And were you like, I imagine this is now a nonprofit. Like it's a. Yes. Was uh, it I, then uh, from the beginning or? Actually, we, we, we used Fractured Atlas, Atlas as, as like, like um, the, the umbrella, umbrella to go to use for that. Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then, then now, now, now it is a 501c3. Yeah. It's awesome. And, and full board and, and all that stuff. stuff. So it's nice. nice. And, and what year was this again? This, this was 2012. Cool. 2012. Yep. Yeah, I mean... Eight years ago, and a lot has happened in eight years. Huh? Oh my gosh, so, so much. So, I, mean, I mean, you can tell, tell this is the quality of the, the footage. footage. Now, now every, every camera, camera is like, like you know, know can record, record 4, 4K. 4K. Oh, sure, 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 sure. Old conducting camera, camera that had HD, you know. Like. <laughs> you know, it's so cool, I mean, that you uh, did this, you know. I mean, for many reasons. One of them, exactly what you were saying, you know young musicians uh whether like in high school or college or in, early in their careers there's so much potential and there's so much learning that you can gain through creating something and, and starting something like this yeah, yeah. And, and that's this, this was, was i mean this, this was, was like, like this, this was, was at the, the time, time i think, think right when, when the conservatories and universities started to add a faculty member for like careers in music or different careers that because that, that, that I mean for so long it was basically like soloist track teaching or orchestra right and and um but there's so much that that a musician talking to you uh high schoolers there's so much that you can do and learn by like, like if, if you, you say, say okay, okay, I'm, I'm going to put on a recital, recital next year, and that that, that one thing you can learn so much from. Okay, okay where's the venue? venue? Who's going to make the posters? posters? Do I want to sell tickets or not? How do I market it? it? Like, like um, can, can I get, get donations, donations for a reception? Like, like everything that, that that goes into planning an event, and and. and and, and when, when you, you do, do that, that and you have, have that on your resume, resume, you just, just gain the skills, and that just puts, puts you ahead of someone who didn't do that. Yeah, and when it comes to college applications, things mm -hmm. like that can can be the uh, the uh, difference maker. Yeah, you know that reminds me of uh, a few MYS students uh, a few years, I, I guess three years ago, they created uh, something called Project Prelude. And uh, mm -hmm. this was, you know, an initiative through which they went out and they taught 
uh, kids at elementary schools to play the violin. And this this was entirely their project. Uh, MYS served served as a fiscal sponsor for mm. this. But they built it. You know, they created it. They engaged fellow young musicians to teach. And, of course, not only did the uh, project uh, was successful, and not only did it bring music education to these kids, but then it, like, you know, it became something on the resume that, uh, you know, admissions committees look at, and they, uh, you know, that says a lot about yeah. about a young person's uh, ability to be, you know, self motivated and to to be creative and and to make something happen um and i mean like the occasional symphony that still exists you know Mm -hmm. project prelude still exists except with other you know young young leaders um so you were doing this you were doing your masters and then uh, you went to Portland, Maine, and there. So that was your first job right out of grad school. And Robert Moody was music director there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And how long were you there in Portland, I Maine? I was, I was in Portland, Portland for. I was in Maine. Maine. For, or now, now we have, have to say Portland. Portland or, or now, now we have, have to say Maine, Maine and, and then in Portland. Portland. Right. Uh, but, but I was, I was there, there for, for three seasons. seasons. Okay. And yeah, yeah so, so and then, then won this position, position in 2016, April. And will you talk about the uh, application and audition process for your main job? How 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 was that process, and what uh, I mean, how how long did it take, etc. So, so for the application, application process, process for Maine, Maine they, that, that position actually required a lot of material. Um, the basic stuff for conductors is the, the conducting video and uh, cover letter, and, but for and resume and references and things like that. But what they wanted was like a video of me interacting with kids. Mm. And, and it just so happened that I recorded the Dr. Seuss concert just a couple of weeks prior, doing some sort of like engagement thing with, with kids. Um, so I included that. And um, then after that, they brought us in for like, they brought four of us in as finalists for a, like two two or three days and like made an entire thing about it so like all four of us we were basically hanging out the whole time but we like were in an event like um donor events they wanted to see us interact with um donors we had to do like a mock speaking thing where we turned around and like pretend you were um to to pretend you conducted the first piece of the concert you have to turn around and they're like third and fourth graders what do you say and then Another, Another one, one like, like the same, same thing, thing but for a pops crowd. You know, you know what, what do you, do you say? say? And have to put on this performance for like, like ten people or this empty hall. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah that's, that's sort of what the and also a bunch, bunch of interviews and uh, things, things like that. that. I, would I would say the one, the two things that I got asked about a lot were occasional symphony, talking about my time in that, and my music education degree background at Alabama. Because this position specifically, um, there were they wanted me to be uh, essentially like, like the the boots on the ground, the conductor who was there all the time, and forming relationships with the schools and the teachers and um, the kids. So. Yeah, and did you? So while you were there doing that, that the whole process. I mean, did you get a sense that you were going to get the job, like? Or did they um, call you later? Or? They I actually, I, f- <laughs> I felt like I nailed the, the audition and then the interviews. So, so I was feeling pretty good about it. And, and I, got I got a phone call the, the next day. Robert called me and um, told me I had gotten a job. job. And, and so, so I, was, I was super excited. excited. But, but yeah, I, was, I, I, I also, also worked really, really, really hard on... Um, techniques, techniques for interviewing, interviewing recording myself for different, different mock answers, answers and 
trying to hear myself saying um a lot or the big words that come up a lot so I could start being a better speaker and because it's I mean all that stuff is scary and we don't realize it but there are a lot of stuff that just comes out sounds that come out of our mouth all the time we don't realize unless you have to sit down and pay attention or you have someone that says you said that you said that again you said that again so yeah it was it was a great learning experience and once you got there, was the job what you expected? Were there any surprises just on the actual, like, doing the work? What what, what was unexpected or, or, mm. um, or challenging? For that, that position, the, the challenging, challenging part, part for me, me at that, that position is when I got, got there the next week, week the um, the person who was there for our education, education the director of education um, was, was finished, finished. And, and so there was, was like, like a month and a half gap where I was doing all the director of education duties and like coordinating dinner concerts, concerts and, and, and building programs and scripts and, and contacting musicians and, th- and like hiring them and things like that, that. so that, that was like a, a that was a big, there were a lot of administrative duties that I wasn't expecting right off the bat. Wow, okay, yeah. But also, you know, I, I could have been upset about it. or Because it's coming out of conservatory, or, like, or in music school, you're just like, oh, yeah, do music. No, 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 no. But, like, that's definitely, it's with the staff conductor role nowadays, or even all musicians, like James and Emily, they, they serve in a lot of, committees and and have to do administrative work outside of of, um, just just being a musician. musician. But um, that was was a really good learning experience experience and and very very unexpected. Mm. (laughs) And you know what, that that goes back to what we were talking about and all the different skills that you can learn as a young musician when you create your own projects and when you do things like that, that all of these skills, you will, you know, eventually need them in some way or another. Right. And, and I mean, look at what we're going through right now, you know, with, with this unprecedented, you know, uh, global event where we we're stuck at home and we have to be creative and we have to just come up with with things, you know, all of those skills that you, Norman, and, you know, our young musicians have learned over time. You know, you, you just never know when you're going to need them, whether, you know, at, at a very practical level or for an application process or an interview and, and so on and so forth. Uh, we have a great, uh, actually, a couple of great questions on the comments that I would like to ask you, Norman. Uh, the uh, first question is, do you practice your conducting as much as a musician practices their instrument? And if you do, how do you practice your conducting? Um... I do, I do not, not practice, practice my actual physical conducting as much as a musician practice their instruments. I do say that I study music as much as a orchestral musician uh, practices, meaning the study the score or whatever is coming up next. Um, with conducting at the beginning, actually, yes, I did. Uh, with the technique, I... Well, in the beginning, it's, it's all like... When you're, when you're learning, learning anything new, fundamentals is like the, the key, right? So, so I remember having a tape on the wall, a blue tape, tape on the wall that had like, like um, a vertical path and horizontal and then drew like, and like just conducted like four patterns and then drew it out on the wall. My teacher made me do that. And then like a three pattern, like the practicing the perfect three pattern, the perfect four pattern, the perfect six eight, turning on a metronome and just being, trying to be as, as much, much in physical, physical control as possible. Like, like doing the Elizabeth Green, like, like these exercises where you build independence in your, see how it's going, independence in your, your both arms. And those I used to practice a lot. And I think musicians, the same thing. You would ask orchestral musicians, people, musicians in the Oregon Symphony. A lot of the foundation, they'll do every once in a while, touch up their foundation. But now it's, all of that is solid. So, and the, the second, second part of the question, question that I, I might have... Well, if you do practice, how do you practice your conducting? Yeah, yeah. so that's, that's, but, that's what I do. It's, it's, it's all um, very, very slow, slow, 
I'm going to speak if you're whoever's wanting to learn conducting. Very slow, fundamental, and then drawing the patterns on a piece of paper, on graph paper, is also very um, enlightening. <laughs> yeah, and one thing, conducting is weird. It's such a weird thing to do because you... you Yes, I mean, you have to learn all the fundamentals and the, there's a conducting technique or there are several different you know, schools of thought about, you know, the physical approach to conducting, but then you can only truly practice conducting in front of a group. I mean, right? Because you're... And, yeah, and, and, and every group is different too. too. And I think that's... I remember, I remember the, the first, first time I conducted, conducded the Baltimore, Baltimore Symphony, Symphony, which was my first time conducting a professional orchestra. It just felt so different. I remember it just the day. Well, not that day. I wasn't. I was slowing down. So the orchestra kept slowing down. I kept thinking, like, why can't I get it moving? It's because I started too slow. Or like I waited. So it's like a lot of things that just like the more you do it, the better you get at it. And you just to do it. But you're right. I mean, I think. Right, right now, now it's, we're, we're both, both like, like, oh my gosh, gosh we're, we, we our, our instrument, instrument is, is a group, group of people, people and, and and it's hard, hard to, that's, that's one thing that is it's tough, to, tough to, tough to do. Yeah, and it's part of the catch-22 to, you know, when you're trying to get started as a conductor, because to mm -hmm. gain experience, you need to be in front of a group. But very yeah. often, in order to even be able to be in front of a group, you need to demonstrate experience, right? So it's mm -hmm. often that those begin, you know, that start making your, your videos with a string quartet of friends or just, you know, you got to be, uh, again, going back to self-starting, right? And I think for a young conductor, that's pretty much, you know, you cannot avoid having to do that on your own at first. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, we have about 11 minutes left. So let's go ahead and go back to your truths and lie statements okay. and let's uh let's let me uh, see what people here have uh voted oh and if you have not voted if you're watching this there are three statements on the screen one of them is a lie so on the live chat whether you're on facebook or youtube vote for which of these statements you believe is a lie i'm going to read them out loud uh and then we'll reveal one of the truths statement a is norman has a small tattoo of the deathly hallows Statement B, Norman recently binge-watched the entire Naruto series in three months, over 700 episodes. Statement C, Norman severely broke his arm playing ping-pong. Okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, let's see. Let me see if I see a trend here on the voting. I see, I see, it's a bit sort of between B and C, perhaps. So, let Let's go ahead and reveal one of your truths, Norman. Okay. So, so one, one of my truths is that I did recently binge watch the entire Naruto uh, series. This was two years ago. I discovered it for the first time, laying on my couch, like, oh, I've always, always heard Naruto's Naruto good. I watched it, and I just remember it was like I was into it so hard and couldn't stop until I was done. <laughs> That's a lot of episodes. A lot of episodes. I mean, I mean they're, they're like, like, I think they're, they're maybe like 200 fillers, maybe, maybe but yeah. yeah. They're yeah. also like 22-minute 20 20 episodes, so. Cool. Okay, so that's a true statement. So if you answer B, you were wrong. But good news, <laughs> you get to change your vote. So if you're still watching and you voted for B, uh, you have a few more seconds to change your vote. Uh, and let's go ahead and reveal your final truth so, so my second truth is, uh, yeah, huh. I did break my arm playing. Whoa! And this is the scar surgery to prove it. Whoa! Well, you don't need a tattoo with uh, right. a scar. And this, this right here is a metal rod, so I've got 13 screws going up there. Well, I guess the bone is grown back together now, but yeah, that's. If, if you, you can, can see, see it, it's, it's like, like it's, it's pretty, pretty gross. gross but. Ah, when did this happen? That's crazy. This, this happened while I was at Peabody, after, like, like February in my first year of grad school. school. Ping pong. Ping pong, yep. yep. So did you fall or what happened? Yeah, yeah I, was I was like, like 
my friend and I, he's a composer, his name's Scott Lee, we're just both super competitive, and he always, like, I, like, hang with him until about halfway, and then he always pulls away. And so I was just being silly and trying to go around the side and slam the ball, and I slipped, fell, hit this, like, wood thing, boom, broke it completely in half, butterfly up here. I, I like, like, my face print was on the student services, services like, glass window. It's <laughs> just, like, the dean of students, and they're, like, running out, like, oh, my God. And, 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 and yeah, it was, yeah, yeah, it was the most pain I've ever been in in my life. <laughs> wow, that is, okay. Wow, okay. There you have it. So uh, the uh, lie is that you... Ooh, I, might I might have, have the x-ray that, that I can pull up very quickly. quickly. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure everyone wants to see the x-ray of my broken arm. Okay, okay here, here it is. Wow. Wow, that is... So right, right there, there, and then you see it splits a little bit yeah. up there. Wow, that is crazy. And I didn't know <laughs> ping pong was so dangerous. <laughs> I know, I know. No, I'm bummed because, because the Olympics, Olympics are uh, not, not happening this summer, summer so I've got to wait for my ping pong big. Yeah. And so, uh, statement A, so you do not have a small tattoo of the Deathly Hallows. I do not. Are, are you into Harry Potter, though? I am, yeah. 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 I read all the books, movies, watch them. Awesome. Cool. Uh, so, if you answered A, you were right, and... Only, uh, I think only one person answered A, so you, you managed to fool many of her viewers, so good for you. I tried to, I, I read uh, in an Arrows of Crime podcast where the more specific you are, well, wait, wait. No, no, I was, I was trying, trying to be specific, specific to make, make it seem like it was true. true. Yeah, so. <laughs> very good. Uh, okay, so speaking of Harry Potter, um, oh, actually, you know what? Oh, man, I wish I had like a whole another hour with you uh, <laughs> let's talk about the Oregon symphony briefly and i mean y y i know that you and i arrived in oregon basically at the same time we mm -hmm. started in the fall of, of 16. Mm -hmm. so what's working with the Oregon symphony been like uh what what are your favorite things about this amazing group of people i think that's that's, that's what, what it is, is. It's, it's, it's a it's, it's an, an amazing, amazing... It's, it's just, just a really an incredible group of people, people from the management to the musicians. I mean, everyone, it, it feels like a family. family. And people talk to each other, people like each other in an orchestra. It's, it's, it's like a, it's a really great place to be. And especially after, after Portland, what was really nice about this position is that I could I had way I have way less administrative duties and and, and focus it and I so I could focus just on covering and studying my scores and conducting and like that has been really really nice. And in your position as associate conductor of the Oregon Symphony, you get to work with an incredible amount of fabulous so guest soloists, guest mm -hmm. artists. So who do you have? Can you give a top three? Favorite uh, guest artists? Oh man, man. Let's, let's see. see. Smokey, Smokey Robinson, Robinson was awesome. Mm. That, he, he was, was awesome. awesome. Uh, God, yeah, he, he was, was he was awesome. Smokey, Smokey Robinson, Wyclef uh, Wyclef John, John was, was also really fun to work with. with. And these these, these people, people like, like there's, there's nothing, nothing that like separates classical from, from pop to, to hip hop. I mean, it's, it's just, just like, like the the level of performing. performing is so high and you're just like oh my god that person knows how to like perform and there's so much to learn in that like art the art of performing and i would say you know like all of the the the, the, the pink martini group every time i perform with like either china storm or thomas or the, the pink martini pink martini group that those are like some, some of the, the funnest, funnest concerts. concerts. Just, Just like, like pure, pure joy. joy. Yeah. Cool job, man. You have a cool job. It's, it's a cool, cool job. job. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you get to work with. Another thing about the symphony is like, like meeting all, all, of, all of these people, people who grow like, like growing up, up. I always viewed as like famous, and, and you meet them, and they're, they're like, like just normal, normal people, people, you know, hanging out backstage. And man, often their bands, the artists. 
come through with their own bands. They're just spectacular musicians too. Musicians. Yeah. 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 Cool. Okay, so uh, we uh, we're gonna run out of time soon, but I have three more things that uh, I would like to ask you to share with our, our viewers. Uh, and let's do a, a super quick segment here. What are you into? And that's mm -hmm. where you, you get to share things that you're into that are not necessarily specifically related to music. And I know you have, a, and we have a bunch in common too, but. Yeah. So let's, let's see. see. One, One thing, thing that, that I've always been interested, interested in is photography. photography. I really, since, since undergrad, I've I, and then I worked at the school newspaper in Alabama for photojournalism. That was really fun. And just going and taking pictures. I've like worked a couple of weddings back. I mean, oh, cool. the best, but it was so fun. Um, also, I'm a gamer as well. So I've got a PS4. I've got a Switch. Um, I had an Xbox, but not anymore. Also, League of Legends. On, I played it. I've spent a lot of of my, my life, life playing League of Legends, Legends back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I noticed that you posted, I think it was a top 10 uh, uh, list of video games for you. Yeah. And I noticed that uh, Breath of the Wild was not there. Breath of the Wild, yeah. yeah. You, you know, know, that, Breath, Breath of the Wild, I, I beat it, it like, like two, two summers, summers, last summer, two summers summer ago. ago. I don't know, whatever it came out. out. And... Um, that, that game was so much fun. fun. I've actually been thinking about playing it again because I need more time into it. But, but when, when I picked that game, I was like, okay, what, like, what games do I like, remember like, fondly? So like, I, if I were to pick a Zelda game, it would be Ocarina of Time. Oh, right. N Nintendo 64. Which, Which I think, I'm like, like hoping they make a remake. There's, There's no way they're... Like, like the, the, the fad. Of, and then I've, I've got, got one more thing, thing too, that um, I do. On my free time... Which is also, also doubling, doubling as a mask, mask these days. <laughs> yes. I, I can just go into the grocery store. <laughs> so when did that get started? Uh, when have have you always been interested in, in motorcycles? Uh, no, this was like 2017. That summer. I was just like, you know what? I've always wanted to learn how to ride a motorcycle. I took the safety course, Oregon safety course, and bought a motorcycle. I was like, this is the funnest thing ever. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Um, and I, by the way, I wanted to compliment you on the space behind you and all the many plants that you have back there. It's beautiful. Oh, that's, that, 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 I should be that to my girlfriend, Catherine. And she's an artist and also loves plants. This is only a quarter of it. <laughs> cool. Yeah, it's a very nice space. Uh, okay, and finally, actually, two more things. Uh, our, we have our, our segment that we call Sound Advice, and this is where I ask our guests if you, Norman, could, could go back in time and find high school Norman, what advice would you have for high school Norman? Yeah, I, I think... I, I thought, thought about, about this a lot, too, because um, just trying, trying to put myself back, back in that mindset. mindset. I, think I think for me, I would go back and say, I'd say, Norman, don't try to please everyone. Mm. Don't, don't try, try to make everyone happy. And don't worry so much about what people think about you. Um, because I think for me, growing up in the South and, and having to be raised in a way where you have to be beat around, around the, the bush, bush, not be so direct. direct. Um, I, I started like building my personality based on what I thought other people would like instead of just being myself and being my true self. I kind of like lost it along after like going into college and stuff. Like that's when I started like losing my true self. And, um, and going into the music world, like that was really hard to be a conductor and that was one of the biggest things I learned in Portland, in Maine, is, is I was so scared to give some sort of like feedback to a musician or an orchestra. I was like, oh, you know, it's really cool. I'd rather just like, hey, horns, it's behind. Boom. Like, okay. Like, all that stuff was built up in my mind. And um, don't worry about trying to please everyone. 
Um, just, just be, be yourself and be truthful to yourself. Wonderful. And finally, Norman, uh, our segment, The Plug, and that's uh, where you ha you get to plug anything that you want, whether it's an upcoming performance or you get to bring attention to anything you want folks to check out. Um, let's see. There was one thing that I learned today, or yet two days ago, about donating tickets back to organizations. And um, if you want to donate your tickets back, if you have a um, ticket, you can't like just leave it like assume that um, if you don't do anything, it'll donate it back. You have to actually let the organization know that you want to donate your ticket back. Because if not, it sits in limbo and then it becomes the property of someone. Like the, or the organization doesn't get the money. So um, I would say, if, yeah, if you want to donate your ticket back, um, which would be excellent, either to whatever performing um, space, you have to call and let them know that you want to donate. And in the case of the Oregon Symphony, folks can go to the website and find a phone number? Or... Yeah, yeah, just call the box office, office and, and someone will, will set, set you up. Cool. Awesome. Well, I very much look forward to next season and to see you back on the podium and, and all of your uh, colleagues and our friends at the Oregon Symphony. And Norman, it's been so fun talking to you. I wish we had two more hours, uh, <laughs> but maybe we can do that in person whenever this is you know, no, no. things go back to normal. Uh, so thank you for spending time with our Metropolitan Youth Symphony musicians and their families and myself. And uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon and we'll, we'll be in touch. Awesome. Thanks, okay. Ralph, for having me. Thank you, Norman. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Uh, so, yes, thank you, Norman. Uh, there was some great advice, by the way. Um, that he shared with us towards the end. And uh, tomorrow, 4 p.m., Carolyn Shaw will be our guest for uh, our virtual hangout. 4 p.m., Carolyn Shaw is an amazing composer, the uh, youngest ever winner of the Pulitzer Prize in Music. Uh, Thursday, we have not one, but two amazing musicians and dear friends from the Oregon Symphony, Marilyn de Oliveira and Trevor Fitzpatrick. Friday. Oh, and uh, Marilyn and Trevor, uh, that show on Thursday, it's at 3 p.m. Not 4, but 3 p.m. Uh, and uh, Friday, 4 p.m., Susan Nance, president and CEO of Old Classical Portland, will be our guest at 4 p.m. And then next week, we start with Dominic Seldis, who is the principal bass player of the Concertgebouw Orchestra. And he's currently in Amsterdam, so this is going to be a morning show for us here in Oregon, 11 a.m. in Oregon, uh, one week from today. Uh, so I will see you all tomorrow. Don't miss this one, you guys. 4 p.m. tomorrow, Wednesday, May 6th. Carolyn Show will be our guest on MY's virtual hangout. So thank you to Norman Wen. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Uh, sorry we didn't get to several of your great questions in the comments. Uh, and uh, everybody take care and uh, stay positive. Talk to you tomorrow.